It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the ViewSonic XG240R. This monitor features a 24-inch TN panel, and it has a 144Hz refresh rate and a Full HD, that's 1920 by 1080 resolution. So this resolution doesn't exactly give you a huge amount of space to play with on the desktop, it doesn't give you massive amount of multitasking potential or anything like that, and the pixel density isn't amazing, but it's not awful in that respect either. This is certainly sort of the, the lower end of, of the resolution spectrum, if you will, um, for what you'll find on a modern monitor these days. But it certainly keeps the costs of the product down. And it also means it doesn't take quite as much GPU horsepower to actually run your games. As usual, there's a written review that accompanies this video review and it goes into detail about some aspects which aren't covered in this video review. So definitely check that out. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. And because it's a video, you have to bear in mind that what you see depends on my camera. It depends on the processing done by my video editing software, depends on YouTube, and ultimately it depends on your own monitor. So. What you see doesn't represent what you'll actually see firsthand using the monitor, but it does allow me to talk through things and give some more visual representations than you'd get from the written review. I'm now going to look at the external features of the monitor. So it has quite a plain black look. It doesn't have any of the red elements that were seen on the XG2402 and earlier models from ViewSonic, but it has quite a blended appearance instead. It's got some lighter grey elements, you can see the ViewSonic logo there, the button labels as well, light grey, and the Elite logo, which identifies the monitor as a member of the new ViewSonic Elite Gaming Monitor series. And the stand has a brushed texture. It's matte black plastic, like the rest of the monitor, and you can see that the bezels moderately thick by modern monitor standards, and they don't use the dual stage bezel design, so that means that the plastic border, the bezel itself, completely covers the panel border, or almost completely covers the panel border, so you don't get a kind of little border around the image. And that's because of the panel itself. It's quite an old panel. Um, it's used on pretty much all of the 24-inch Full HD 144Hz TN models, uh, and that doesn't have a dual stage bezel design. The screen surface is medium matte anti-glare, and this offers effective glare handling, so you don't get sharp reflections or strong glare from ambient light, but you should always try and moderate your room lighting as well as possible, um, regardless of screen surface. And this also has a knock-on effect on the image quality in terms of the, the smoothness of the image, and I explore that elsewhere in the review. The included stand offers full ergonomic flexibility, so you can adjust the height of the monitor. You can also tilt the screen backwards a bit and forwards very slightly. You can swivel the screen left and right. And you can also rotate it 90 degrees clockwise into portrait. And when it's in the portrait orientation, you can actually lower the stand height so it's pretty much touching the stand base. So it's got quite a, a compact design in portrait, which is quite good. From the side, you can see that there is a lot of matte black plastic again. The screen itself is reasonably thin, not super thin, but it has quite a robust stand design and I've shown you the ergonomic flexibility of that already. At the rear, you can see again, lots of matte black plastic. The exception really are these chevrons there. They house the Elite RGB lighting feature, which is explored in the OSD video. When they're switched off, as they are now, they kind of just blend in quite nicely. So that, again, there aren't any red elements at the back. So that's a bit different to the older model. There's a little area at the top where you can put your fingers if you want to carry the uh, monitor or perhaps more correctly put your thumb. It lets you sort of grab onto the stand to carry the monitor a bit. And there's also a headphone hook at the top, a little retractable headphone hook, which is quite a neat little feature. There's a little clip-on cable tidy as well. If you prefer, you can just remove that. It's quite easy to just clip on and off. 
The other aspects to note, there is a K slot, Kensington lock slot, and then the down firing ports. I've got the monitor in portrait just so I can show you the ports more clearly. There's an AC power input, which means the monitor has an internal power converter. There are two USB 3 downstream ports plus upstream. They're coloured blue just because it blends in a bit better with the rest of the monitor versus the standard yellow colour. There are two HDMI 1.4 ports, which support adaptive sync and hence support AMD FreeSync on compatible systems and GPUs. And there is a DisplayPort 1.2a input, which also supports adaptive sync. There is a 3.5mm headphone jack, and again that doesn't have the usual green coloration. Instead it has a blue which blends in a bit better. And I can see from the, the symbol there, I called it a headphone jack, I think it's, it's technically an audio output. So the, the blue coloration is actually correct for that. Although you can't really see them, there are also down firing 2 watt speakers. There's one there I believe and one there. So there's a stereo speaker system. It's quite low powered and it offers basic sound output but don't expect any incredible quality. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm going to talk about the contrast performance of the monitor. This monitor uses a TN panel so they aren't known for having amazing contrast. The, the contrast performance though is, is pretty decent on my unit. I will mention that this panel, the panel that's used here, has actually a panel from 2011. It's a very old panel and it's used by many products of this type. It has a lot of variation when it comes to contrast, so the static contrast on my unit was actually close to 1000 to 1 using my test settings. It does go up a bit if you reduce the refresh rate, but it, it's not a massive difference, so I wouldn't worry about the refresh rate uh, in terms of contrast. It's just a slight observation I had. Um, if you recall, my unit of the XG2402 had really bad static contrast, which is actually about half um, of the value I recorded on this one. So this one's quite close to 1000 to 1, even using my test settings. Whereas my XG2402, that was sort of close to 500 or 600 to 1. Um, unfortunately, this panel does have quite a lot of variation. So when I'm talking about contrast, be aware I'm talking about the contrast of my unit and what I'm seeing here. It is not necessarily going to be exactly the same on other units, but on average, I mean, I have gathered a lot of user feedback on this model and also others that use the panel, including the predecessor to this model. And most of the units are closer to this than they are my XG2402 sample, which had obvious problems with contrast. So it doesn't have the kind of depth and atmosphere you get from a decent VA model, for example. It doesn't have that kind of depth at all, and especially if you're viewing in a dark room as I am now, just to sort of help highlight uh, the, the contrast on the video. But it doesn't look completely washed out, and it doesn't have IPS glow because it's not an IPS panel. However, you will notice that it is darker towards the top. I've actually adjusted the camera so that it's more in line with what you'd see with your eyes, because the ergonomically correct viewing position is to have the sort of top third of the monitor in line with your eye level rather than having the center of the monitor in line with your eyes. So that's why it might look a bit weird on the video, why have I sort of mounted it in this way. It gives you a more accurate representation of the viewing angles from a normal viewing position. I would say it does exaggerate on the video even so, sort of the darkening towards the top, but there is certainly a much higher perceived gamma at the top versus the bottom of the screen and that's characteristic of TN panels. So what this means, my monitor is calibrated to 2.2 gamma or thereabouts centrally and the monitor as I've explored in the OSD video gives you lots of flexibility to adjust that. So the level of detail in the centre of the screen is more or less as it should be. I would mention though that the panel itself does have some sort of slight issues with I don't want to say banding because people have horrible sort of nightmarish things in their head when I mention that, but it does raise detail a bit more than it should even in the centre of the screen, despite the, the gamma being quite well tuned in that region. And that's just because of the panel and the colour setup. It's quite common for TN panels to have some issues there. But I would mention it's nothing like what you'd get on, for example, the Dell S2417DG or S2716DG. And they have an issue because the gamma is far too low out of the box. And if you correct it, especially with an NVIDIA GPU, it actually gives you banding for other reasons. 
um, and it never it's never quite comfortable and it doesn't sort of give you a nice masking of detail and these little details like the cracks in the rock and stuff like that they're sort of far more visible than they should be on this model essentially they're sort of a bit more visible than they should be but it doesn't have a kind of blocky weird appearance so it's much better than the the Dell models I've just mentioned and further up it is masked and again that is exaggerated on the video but even to the eyes you do see that some of the dark detail is lost um, and on this game that can be a bit of an issue because there are lots of vertical puzzles so you have to look at which walls have the right texture to climb on um, so you can sort of jump over with Lara and, and climb onto them but it's difficult to do that when you can't really see the sort of porous rock texture properly towards the top of the monitor. But this effect is actually more extreme on larger TN models. This is only 24 inches, but if you're looking at models which are sort of 27 inches, the effect is exaggerated because there is a greater viewing angle discrepancy between the top and the bottom of the screen. Moving on from that, the brighter elements, they do stand out fairly well. Um, but as I've said, the contrast's not amazing. It's, uh, it's not awful either. So these bright elements stand out quite well and the screen surface is medium matte anti-glare. So it has a bit of a grainy look to it. Um, these brighter elements but it's not awful it's not a kind of heavy smeary graininess and I've actually before this I've used a few monitors including one with the TN panel which was quite a bit more grainy than this so I sort of certainly would say this is fairly average in terms of graininess it's not too bad but I do personally prefer lighter matte screen surfaces myself or even glossy screen surfaces um, but certainly uh, the screen surface on this is not awful in that respect. I'm now going to talk about colour reproduction and I like to start this section off by looking at the Legom viewing angles tests because they can help highlight some of the weaknesses in colour consistency in a very specific way and a way which is very clear in the video and indeed clear to the eye when you're just observing the monitor. So that's legom.nl, the website. So it has this Legom text test which I like to use in my reviews and ideally this would appear a blended grey throughout so it wouldn't have this kind of red hue that you can see for most of the screen. But um, being a TN model, the perceived gamma shifts, which I've mentioned with respect to contrast, they also affect the colour reproduction. And you can see when you lower your head or lower the camera, there's a sort of green striping. And further up, um, if you raise your head, raise the camera, that becomes red. So from a normal viewing position, you tend to see kind of a bit of green towards the top, then goes orange, and then it goes red further down. And this always shifts very readily, especially vertically, according to head movement. But that's all typical for TN models. It's a characteristic of the panel. It does translate to changes in saturation. Um, when you're viewing a solid colour like this, you can see that the, the top of this purple block is sort of a, a fairly nice lilac colour. Whereas further down, there's a stronger pink hue. And that pink hue shifts readily along with head movement as does the more intense kind of lilac colour towards the top. And then there's the red block and that appears a fairly saturated red towards the top, becomes a kind of burnt red further down, and at the very bottom it has quite a pinkish hue to it. But again the hues shift very readily, vertically, according to your viewing angle. And there's the green block, it looks a sort of yellowish green throughout. Um, this is something that's quite uh, common for models without a particularly large colour gamut. It never quite looks a, a true sort of vibrant green. It always has a yellowish hue to it, but there's more yellowing towards the bottom, um, although the, the changes with this particular shade aren't as extreme as the other ones I just showed. And the blue block, as is typical, it's a quite a nice solid blue throughout. There aren't any clear changes. There can be some changes according to um, sort of brightness and uniformity across the panel but they're not really viewing angle related issues there. I'm now on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. Again note the mounting position of the camera is purposefully high than centre to try and give a better idea of what you should see from the ergonomically correct viewing position but be aware of all the things I've mentioned in terms of it being a video and not really representing exactly how the monitor will look etc. So as I mentioned in the contrast section I've calibrated this monitor to have good 2.2 gamma centrally and this does give things a much richer look overall than you get on some models using this panel 
And I've, I've reviewed many monitors using this panel and gathered a lot of user feedback because it's a panel that's been used since 2011. It's not a new panel at all. And I know that there's a massive amount of variation in the gamma um, that you'll get out of the box for these monitors. This model offers really good flexibility in the OSD to change the gamma, thankfully. So you can usually get it sort of closer to how you like. And I've managed to get mine nice and close to the 2.2 gamma curve, which I like to follow. So as I said, overall, quite a rich look, quite a natural look to the image. It doesn't have that massively washed out, flooded look that you get with monitors where you can't correct the gamma like this through the OSD. But the perceived gamma does change depending on which area of the screen you're looking at. So towards the top of the screen, colours are more saturated and a bit deeper. Whereas towards the bottom of the screen, further down, if you're viewing the same shades, they lose some saturation and they become sort of, I wouldn't necessarily say washed out, but relative to the top of the screen, certainly a lot more faded looking towards the bottom, far less saturation. And these shifts are actually quite pronounced for a monitor of this size. They're, they're always there to some extent on TN models, but this particular panel does show sort of more extreme variation in saturation levels comparing the top to the bottom than some TN models of this size. And in fact, even more than some TN models, which are a bit bigger than this. But as long as you've got the, the gamma sort of set up how you like centrally, um, you'll notice that most of the image sort of looks quite rich and it doesn't sort of have a horrible washed out look that you get with models with obvious gamma problems. So, I mean, this, I'm not going to sort of beat around the bush and say that there are some awesome vibrant elements and, and colours look really vivid because that would be lying. The, the colour gamut of this monitor, for example, it tracks quite close to sRGB. I actually measured 100% sRGB coverage on my model. Um, there is a little bit of variation with different backlights. Again, this panel does show a lot of variation in, in various aspects and colour gamut's one of them. It doesn't show massive variation though, it's always quite close to sRGB. It doesn't have much overextension. Um, so that means that colours are represented fairly accurately, at least in the centre of the screen if you've calibrated things. But as I've mentioned, there's perceived gamma changes up and down the screen in particular, and they do change the perception of colour. I'm now on Battlefield 5 again, and I'm going to talk about responsiveness on the monitor. There's an article on the website all about monitor responsiveness, and that looks at various different aspects of responsiveness. And there's a key concept called perceived blur, which is explored in that article. And this is also mentioned a bit in the written review, or summarised in the written review. But it's a very important concept to understand, especially when it comes to understanding what to expect from a high refresh rate monitor. So this monitor is pumping out 144 hertz and I've got the game running at 144 frames a second so it's taking maximum advantage of the monitor's high refresh rate. With this you're getting 2.4 times as much information pumped out every second as a 60 hertz monitor and this greatly reduces the perceived blur and this is partly independent of pixel responsiveness because this part of perceived blur which is reduced by increased refresh rate is actually because it reduces the eye movement and it's the movement of your eyes which creates a lot of blur that you see on a monitor. So this has greatly reduced perceived blur simply for the increased refresh rate and frame rate. The other aspect of the high frame rate is that it improves what I call the connected feel. So as I'm interacting with my character on the game world, as I'm interacting with the game world, there's a certain fluidity and a certain precision with my movements of the camera um, things just translate to movements much more quickly. And this is separate to input lag, which does affect the connected feel. But this particular aspect of connected feel I'm talking about is again down to the high refresh rate and frame rate. But speaking of input lag, it's very low indeed on this monitor. I actually measured slightly less than I did on the XG2402, which is already imperceptibly low in my opinion. So it's it's good to see that um, input lag is certainly not an issue on this monitor, so it's definitely not something you have to worry about. So having such a low input lag does improve the connected feel and certainly helps deliver that really nice connectedness with the 144Hz refresh rate. Pixel responsiveness is indeed important as it does affect perceived blur and distinct weaknesses there can cause trailing or as some people might just call it ghosting. And if the pixel overdrive or the greater grey acceleration 
isn't tuned very well, you might also find what's called overshoot or inverse ghosting, and there's kind of bright trails or shadowy trails, which can be quite unsightly. This monitor, however, it has really, really well optimized pixel overdrive. It doesn't have any distinct weaknesses in terms of pixel responsiveness. I would say that the, the older model, the XG2402, when using the optimal overdrive setting, which is fast, in my opinion, this did give a little bit of what I call light powdery trailing. Most users wouldn't notice this, but this monitor actually has improved on that even because it's cut out the slight amount of powdery trailing and it has not replaced it with obvious overshoot, which is sometimes what you get when you completely try and eliminate this trailing. This is really the best performance I've seen on this particular panel that's used. ViewSonic have really done an excellent job at tuning things using again the fast response time setting, which I consider optimal. So I don't have to sit here and show you weaknesses as I do with many monitors, even with these sort of dark to light or high contrast transitions here, there's really nothing that stands out as a weakness. So it really does give a very good and very convincing 144 Hz performance. This monitor also supports adaptive sync. So that means that you can use AMD FreeSync on a compatible GPU or system. And it now also means that you can use G-Sync compatible mode with an NVIDIA GTX 10 series or above GPU. So I've actually done most of the testing with this monitor with a GTX 1080 Ti, and I found that Adaptive Sync works very similarly indeed to FreeSync on my current AMD GPU that I'm using right now. That's the RX 580. There, was, there were no specific issues that I noticed on the NVIDIA GPU that weren't present on the AMD GPU. So NVIDIA users can absolutely expect a FreeSync-like performance. And what I'm talking about here absolutely applies to NVIDIA systems now as well. So I'm really happy to see that NVIDIA is now supporting Adaptive Sync. So what this does, it's not much use now. I'm, I'm running at 144 frames a second very solidly, so that doesn't actually come into play at all. So the frame rate has now dropped. It's often below 120 frames a second, in fact. So it's sort of, it's still triple digits, but it's quite low triple digits a lot of the time. And if you didn't have Adaptive Sync enabled, then you would notice obvious tearing if you had FreeSync disabled, or you'd notice obvious stuttering if you had VSync enabled. I say obvious, it's obvious to me and users who are sensitive to tearing and stuttering, but not everyone is so sensitive to it. It's certainly nice to have the tearing and stuttering from frame rate and refresh rate mismatches removed. So what the monitor is doing is it's dynamically adjusting its refresh rate to match the frame rate of the content where possible. And that does indeed remove those mismatches. So I've changed the settings and it now dips into the double digits, but it's still fairly high double digits. And what I would say is, although the tearing and stuttering has gone, I certainly notice a decrease in connected feel and an increase in perceived blur when comparing to the experience at the much higher frame rate, so sort of near 144 frames a second. One thing to bear in mind, I had noticed that there wasn't really any obvious overshoot at 144 Hz and really high frame rates and refresh rates, but if you've got adaptive sync on, the monitor will adjust its refresh rate as the frame rate drops. And one common weakness with FreeSync is that there's more noticeable overshoot as the refresh rate drops, and that's because unlike G-Sync, Monitors don't tend to use variable overdrive, and that means that the pixel overdrive is really tuned for those much higher frame rates, and it uses the same sort of strong voltage surges, and when your frame rate drops and your refresh rate therefore drops as well, you really don't need that kind of voltage surge, and all that does is give you strong overshoot. However, this model, and it's partly because the panel itself is actually very responsive and it doesn't need extreme overdrive to get decent performance out of it, does not have very strong overshoot. It is stronger at these reduced frame rates, um, around 80 to 90 frames a second, and it's actually not very obvious at all there. So I'm now around 60 frames a second. It's just 62 at the moment. So yeah, hovering around 60 frames a second. I can now see a kind of light trail, a bright trail, what I like to call a snail slime trail behind this tree there. And I don't know if that'll come out on the camera. It's not super obvious though, but it is something which 
it's really very faint at much higher frame rates and you don't really notice but at these lower frame rates it kind of comes out a bit there's also what i call shadowy trailing at the top here around this light it's um, another form of overshoot and again that's not really visible at all at much higher frame rates and refresh rates however one thing I have observed, and as I've said, these aren't really obvious examples of overshoot. They're just more obvious than the really sort of non-existent overshoot at the higher frame rate. But I would mention on many FreeSync models, this overshoot at these kind of frame rates can be absurdly high. Um, and I'll just, I'll just show you what I mean. If I adjust the response time setting of the monitor... So it's called response time OD on this, and these are all explored in the written review. I don't need to go through them here because I've established that fast is indeed optimal by quite some way, especially at the higher frame rates. But I've now put it on the fastest mode, and you can see very strong overshoot. You can see obvious bright trails, quite colourful, sort of uh, some flashes of purple, much, much brighter than the background colour in general or the object colour. And the shadowy trailing now is absolutely ridiculous. And some FreeSync models, regardless of which overdrive setting you're using or which response time setting you're using, will show this kind of thing at reduced frame rates like this, even though it doesn't really show it at higher frame rates. And that can be a right pain in the backside. But this model, just to reinforce the point, really doesn't have a particular issue if you've got the response time set to fast, which I prefer. So again, it's a bit of overshoot, but as you can see, it's nothing like what I've just shown you with the fastest setting. I've now got the monitor running without free sync, without any adaptive sync, anything like that, and it's running at a static 60 hertz refresh rate. And the overshoot is actually stronger now. In fact, things are quite weird. There's actually a kind of bit of shadowy trailing here, which wasn't there before, behind the, the, the flag post there, for example, it almost looks like an after image. So it's, it's not extreme, but it is actually more noticeable than with FreeSync enabled, which is quite interesting. So essentially I consider the FreeSync works well on this model, even at these much lower frame rates. And just to round this section off, I'd like to talk about LFC, low frame rate compensation. So I've got FreeSync active again, on the monitor and with the GPU and it's running at 144 Hertz or I should say I've set it to 144 Hertz as a static refresh rate it's obviously not running at that because the frame rate is quite low in fact it's very low you can see I'm not sure if you can actually see in the video but my frame rates around 35 frames a second at the moment now FreeSync on this monitor goes down to 48 Hertz and if it goes below that LFC low frame rate compensation kicks in and I'll actually show you, if you go into the setup menu in the OSD, and then you go to information, you can see V frequency. Now that's actually around 70 hertz, and that's because the monitor is setting its refresh rate to a multiple of the frame rate, because it can't go down to 35 hertz. That's not possible. It doesn't go that low. It's below 48 hertz, which is the lowest. So instead it's just sticking to a multiple of the frame rate with its refresh rate and that keeps tearing and stuttering at bay as well. And just to round this section off with some further good news, there is an LFC-like technology implemented on NVIDIA GPUs as well when you're using this monitor with adaptive sync or the G-Sync compatible mode. So this exact same behaviour with the monitor keeping to a multiple of the frame rate with its refresh rate occurs on NVIDIA GPUs as well and that keeps tearing and stuttering at bay. But again, just to mention, these really low frame rates do not feel nice. The connected feels completely gone. Perceived blur is way higher. Things are really quite horrible compared to those higher frame rates anyway. But there's not that tearing and stuttering from the mismatches, so it's really nice to have that removed. So to wrap up then, this monitor doesn't really offer anything revolutionary over the XG2402, but ViewSonic did make a few little tweaks. The most noticeable tweaks are to the actual styling of the monitor, Again, there's nothing dramatically different. It uses a similar chassis, but it has a kind of stealthier look. They've removed the red elements, which some users didn't like. And they've also added this Elite RGB feature, which I explore more in the OSD video. So I'm not going to repeat too much about that now. But I did kind of like that feature. 
It's something that I find kind of quite soothing to look at, but I would have preferred it to have had a bit more flexibility in the OSD itself to control that rather than having to rely on software. It retains the ergonomic flexibility of the older model as well, and the stand design is quite decent in, in the sense that it doesn't have a particularly deep design. It doesn't take up a massive amount of desk space, which is certainly a positive. Some gaming monitors go a bit crazy with their stand designs, so it's good not to have that. And there's not too much to complain about. It doesn't have the most exciting look, but that can go both ways because it doesn't have any sort of divisive elements, which some users wouldn't like as well. Quite a matte black plastic heavy look, really. In terms of the contrast performance, the monitor delivered what I'd expect from the panel and it had static contrast, which was quite close to a thousand to one. A bit of variation depending on the refresh rate and also the settings used, but fairly typical for a TN model in terms of the contrast. It didn't have the issue which my XG2402 had with really very weak static contrast. That's not something that all XG2402s have, so I'm not saying that this model is much better in that respect. Both models are usually better than my XG2402 are in terms of contrast. So it didn't deliver anything incredible, it didn't give you amazing depth and atmosphere, it didn't give you amazing pop to the bright elements, and the screen surface is medium matte anti-glare, so those brighter elements didn't look as smooth as they could, but it didn't have anything which made it look completely flooded or anything sort of untoward in terms of the TN panel. Being a TN panel, it had strong perceived gamma shifts, so detail levels in dark scenes vary depending on whether you're looking at the top or bottom of the screen. And in the center of the screen, there was a little bit of extra detail, more than there should have been, which revealed some unintended detail. But that certainly wasn't extreme, and certainly wasn't extreme if you compare to, for example, the, the Dell S2716DG or S2417DG. In terms of color reproduction, it was, again, much as I'd expect from the panel used, and I've had a lot of experience with models using this panel. It's a very common panel on high refresh rate 24 inch TN models with full HD resolution. The, the color gamut is close to sRGB. I actually measured 100% sRGB coverage on my unit, which is uh, not always something you'll find with these models, but uh, it was nice to have. There wasn't much overextension beyond that though, so things didn't really look particularly vibrant. However, importantly, the gamma handling of this model, at least with the OS tweaks that I made, I was able to get good 2.2 gamma tracking on my unit, which is where I wanted things to be. And that means that it doesn't have that sort of flooded and washed out look that you get with some models that use this panel and that don't offer the same level of flexibility in the OSD. So overall, things looked fairly rich and certainly more rich than they did on models that don't have that kind of flexibility. And being a TN panel, as I've mentioned, perceived gamma shifts. It also affects the saturation levels. So things look more saturated towards the top of the screen, much less saturated lower down. And this particular panel, the loss of saturation towards the bottom is a bit stronger than on some TN panels, although all TN panels do exhibit this to a degree. Where this monitor really shone though was in terms of its responsiveness. The ViewSonic XG2402 already set the bar high in this respect. It didn't have any obvious weaknesses in terms of pixel responsiveness, anything like that. But it had some slight weaknesses. It had some sort of what I call light powdery trailing. This model, however, using the same optimal fast setting, didn't have that. And it didn't replace it with obvious overshoot either. There was a bit of overshoot creeping in at lower frame rates and lower refresh rates. And I mentioned lower frame rates because if you've got adaptive sync active, that does cause the refresh rate to go down. And that did cause more noticeable overshoot. But there was nothing extreme, even at these much lower frame rates and refresh rates. So compared to some FreeSync models, that wasn't an issue. I was also pleased to, to see that Adaptive Sync worked on my NVIDIA GPU and it gave a very similar experience to FreeSync, except that my NVIDIA GPU is far more powerful, so I get much higher frame rates in general. But it is really nice to have this kind of technology because even then there are some sort of little dips you can get. It might not always be because of the GPU, sometimes the CPU or other things in the game can cause these fluctuations in frame rate. And I find the tearing and stuttering very jarring if I have adaptive sync disabled or the monitor doesn't support it. So it certainly is nice to have that technology in my opinion.
The monitor also provided very low input lag. It was a shade lower than the input lag on the XG2402. Perhaps that's because the pixel responsiveness is a bit better, but either way, very low input lag, very little signal delay, uh, nothing to really complain about in that respect as a 144Hz monitor. It really delivered a very solid 144Hz experience and with Adaptive Sync doing its thing, delivered a nice experience at lower frame rates as well. So that's really all there is to the ViewSonic XG240R. Be sure to check out the full review on pcmonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.